hello, Tribe. We're back here today. Today we're going to be interviewing Grandmaster Jason Velez, and we're going to be speaking specifically about Korean martial arts and the combative military arts from Korea. Jason, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you so much. An honor to be here. Great. Now, Jason, you, you and I made contact online a few years ago, and I've been following what you do for a couple of years now, and you, you've got a wealth of information. We're going to be talking uh, primarily about Korean martial arts, but just so the audience is aware, you have a, a very deep training background involved in Jeet Kune Do, Krav Maga, and some other martial arts. So can you tell the audience just a, a brief synopsis of, of yourself, how you got started in the martial arts, and some of the martial arts that you've trained in? Okay. Uh, briefly, uh, like most people, got into martial arts because of uh, Bruce Lee. And I was in New York. Uh, they didn't have any Jeet Kune Do schools. So I kind of cross-trained even uh, early back in the 70s. And uh, the most open schools were, for me, were the Korean schools, Taekwondo, Hapkido. Uh, in particular, a guy named uh, Grandmaster Ed Gross, who was bringing all the Korean arts to the East Coast. He was kind of like the uh, Peter Urban of the Korean martial arts. That was my start. Now, you, how long did you train in the Korean martial arts in New York? Uh, pretty much I trained from the time I was seven all the way up through high school, and then I went straight into the military. Now, Jason, I don't want to have you date yourself, but what years were you training in, uh, in Taekwondo and Hapkido? Uh, I started in 64, and uh, to this day I'm still training in the uh, Korean martial arts. Okay. Now, the reason I ask that is because it's been my experience that, especially more so, I think, than any other branch of the martial arts, but it seems like that the Korean martial arts from that era are, were a very different animal than what we see today. Um, it, for example, I take my children to a Taekwondo school and and I don't recognize that martial art being taught there as the same Taekwondo that I sampled when I was you know, their age. It just seems like a whole different beast. What are your thoughts on that? I totally agree with you. Uh... Most of Taekwondo was very military back then, uh, very powerful, very much like karate. In fact, because of the 40 years that the Japanese uh, were ruling over them, a lot of their martial arts were influenced by Shotokan, actually, Shotokan Karate. So you'll see a lot of uh, similarity even in the forms you can pick up. It's the same exact form. Now, Jason, when you went into the military, tell us about that. You went into the Marine Corps? Uh, yes, I went into the uh, Marine Corps. Uh, first six years, I did in the Marine Corps, and I went straight overseas, which was kind of my plan. I wanted to study martial arts. Uh, got stationed in Okinawa, the birthplace of karate. Uh, got to train with a lot of the founders and grandmasters there. Then I jumped on a ship. It's called a uh, battalion landing ship that goes from port to port. And I would go to these different ports and always check out the uh, the local dojos and martial arts of that country. So I got to uh, go to Korea, Thailand, Taiwan, uh, China, and uh, Philippines, just all over the place, just sampling and cross-training everywhere I could. Now, tell me about your time in Korea, because it's my understanding that you were able to train with some pretty elite units in, in martial arts there with the military in Korea. My, my training in Korea, that was different from the other ports because we actually went there for a, a, a really big training exercise. They almost uh, tried to recreate uh, D-Day from World War II. Uh, so all kind of units were there, elite units, special forces units. I myself was a, a part of the uh, Marine Recon. And I got to train with two groups. Uh, one is the, uh, the Rock Rangers, a uh, really tough elite group over there. And they specialize in hot keto, uh, especially for combat. The other group that I got to train with is called the White Horse Division, and that is sort of their Delta Force or the Korean uh, version of Delta Force. They taught a special art called Tukang Musul, and that just translates as Special Forces Martial Art. And that's where I got my start and my idea for what I'm doing now. Now, historically, the the Korean martial arts, and there's 
some of the audience may be familiar with the, the concept of the the uh, the Korean Knights, and there was a subdivision of the Korean Knights in their in their their folklore about the Sulsa. And tell us about the Sulsa. Who are they, and how did that relate to the military units that you were working with in Korea? Okay, uh, most of the Korean martial arts you can uh, you can date them or follow them back to the the Farang, W or rather uh, H W A R A N G, uh, Farang which means the flowerhood of man, uh, it was kind of like your elite academy, a military academy. And they got the best guys from all over the country. Uh, that unit, as tough as they were, would pick the best out of their ranks, and they would become the Sulsa. Uh, Sulsa <coughs> means technician. Uh, another way to describe it would be their special technicians or their special forces. And uh, these guys were the guys that I guess we would consider like Delta Force, the best of the best. And uh, they're known as Korean Ninja. They did pretty much the same type of training, the same type of missions. So there's, a, there's a legend that two very famous Farang warriors went to Japan and that they influenced a lot of the Japanese arts. So that one's up for argument. I won't, I won't touch that one, but... <laughs> Uh, that's you'll also see a lot of similarities between uh, hapkido and aki jujitsu, aikido, and so forth. So the units that you were training with were, for the most part, a modern day equivalent of the ancient sulsa. They were. They were the uh, the elite, the modern version of where the sulsa and the sulsa do, the art, has gone. Uh, they still do a lot of the things the old style way. Um, there's a legend among the the elite uh, special forces groups. The Koreans are called the men of steel, and that's because they do a lot of stuff the old old school way, just like the Sulsa did. Uh, I've seen them repel, uh, you know, off mountains facing down. I've seen them jump in ice cold water with no special gear. Um, so to this day, they really hold that that title and that type of training very high, and it's it's very much alive today within that group. Now, the training, it sounds like there's a lot of physicality to the training. Is the training geared more towards unarmed combat or being military men? Are they specializing in, in handheld weapons like knives and things like that? What What did you learn from them as far as the weaponry versus the hand-to-hand? -hand? Uh, it was, for them, it was a way of life. I mean, uh, from early in the morning, I can I can remember getting up like 4:30 in the morning, going out to the field with them in ice cold weather, and uh, these guys would train with their shirts off and do a full two three hour workout martial arts workout, and that was before they would begin uh, their day of shooting or uh, special training or what we call military uh, training today. So uh, these guys all day long, all night. This is what they do. They they actually live it. You know, it's uh, one big, gigantic system for them. Now, taking that experience that you had initially early on in your career with, with Hapkido and Taekwondo and then learning the military martial arts of Korea in, in modern Korea, where did you go from there? Where did your journey take you after training there? Uh, after training there, I spent a lot of time in the Philippines. So I saw another part of the, the martial arts, which is often neglected, which is your, your weapons, especially uh, edge weapons and impact weapons like the Kali sticks and so forth. So uh, that kind of took me to another level that didn't deter my training in, in the Hapkido or the Tukong. Um, but I tried to integrate the two of them and see how I could make those fit. And uh, that was a bit of a challenge at first, uh, but then it fit very nicely once you get the concepts down. And you currently teach this aspect of martial arts. And what is the the name of the system that that you teach now? This combined method. Uh, the combined method that I came up with is called the Nine Dragons system. And uh, this also came from Korea and China. Uh, nine dragons basically means the number nine is the highest single digit in the uh, in numerology. And it refers to an individual. So the highest level we can achieve as an individual would be the level nine. Uh, the dragon, as we know in martial arts, means the 
the ultimate animal or mystical animal. It has all the uh, skills of all the different animals, like the tiger, the snake, the crane. So combining these two would mean like the ultimate, the ultimate martial art. So I call it Nine Dragons system. Now, your current system is not limited only to the Korean martial arts and the Filipino martial arts. What other elements have gone into it from your from your other training? Uh, basically, uh, Ji Kune Do concepts. If uh, the audience is familiar with that, I, uh, I really follow a lot of the Ji Kune Do concepts, especially uh, using no system as the system, uh, using no boundary as my boundary. So you are free to train as much as you want and outside the box. And I actually encourage that very much. Uh, the core is still the uh, the Tukang Musul, and the secret to that is that they use the different ranges and find out what is superior in long range, what is superior in the trapping range, like Bruce Lee found out, what is superior when you're on the ground. Uh, so once you figure out that matrix, it kind of gives you the upper hand in all these different scenarios. Now tell us about your academy. You're located in, in California, correct? Correct. Uh, last uh, 12 years, I was in Las Vegas, Nevada, and uh, had a great following there. Uh, I recently just relocated to Hollywood, California, and uh, two reasons. One, uh, my daughter lives out here, and the other reason, I'm pursuing an acting career in the uh, martial arts and action films. So uh, that's, that's my goal lately, on top of... Uh, keeping the martial arts alive and the Nine Dragons uh, Academy going. Now, if a student were to come to your school, what is the progression for them? How do you work with your students? What's your training method with them? Do you start them off with with any particular martial art, or do you start them off with empty hand, or are you teaching weapons from day one? How do you structure the, the learning for your students? What I do... Uh, it's still going to be the Tukong Musul method. Uh, it actually almost mirrors to a T Jeet Kune Do. So there's only uh, two stances we have, uh, the offensive on guard and the offensive on guard. Uh, hand position, everything is just like Jeet Kune Do. The movement's just like Jeet Kune Do. Uh, we teach them um, the 12 ways of uh, striking with a knife, or what they call the Kali 12. So you have your number one, your number two, and so forth. And I immediately show them what to do if they're empty-handed with those strikes and what to do with a stick or any other weapon in your hand. So from day one, they're learning a, a matrix really quick, really fast. Now, Jason, let me ask you, being a military man and a lifelong martial artist, I ask this question of all our guests that are involved with the military and military training. What are your thoughts on the current training programs that are available? I know the, the Marine Corps in the last few years has really made an effort to kind of re revolutionize their training and to take it on a whole new model of training. Do you feel that they're on the right track with the martial arts training now? Would you prefer to see them doing something a little bit differently? Uh, this has been a, a lifelong battle <laughs> ever since I was in, in the uh, military. Uh, six years in the Marine Corps, and then I went uh, into the uh, U.S. Army's 18th Airborne Corps and ended up doing uh, 25 years altogether. But I've always tried to change their hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat and their combatives, and uh, it's, it's just a lifelong fight against the politics and the red tape. They've come a long way since MMA became popular, but in my opinion, I think they're still doing it wrong. I think they're still learning way too much material, which which takes years, as you know, to master. And it's almost become an MMA community. And uh, the one thing they're forgetting about is they're wearing uh, black vests and helmets and heavy equipment and backpacks. Um, so to go to the ground in the battlefield, bad, bad concept to do, in my opinion. Uh, I think they should right now focus more, and I'm, I'm going to suggest Krav Maga, actually. And Krav Maga is one of the arts that you're certified to teach and that you teach at your academy? Uh, yes. 
And what about Krav Maga do you think is ideal for the military community here in the States? I think the uh, the key to Krav Maga and why it's become so popular is uh, two reasons. One, they don't look at it as a martial art or a traditional martial art in the aspect of uh, rituals or learning katas or learning uh, all the things that were done 1,500 years ago. Their whole outlook is totally self-defense, 100%. They just want to get rid of the threat, whatever it is, and they want to move on. They don't want to stay engaged. Uh, the training scenarios are very real uh, versus what we used to do in some of our schools, like the point fighting or the, the touch fighting and so forth like that. They introduce stress drills, endurance drills. Um, they'll have a guy with a gun in your face. You take care of him, turn around, here's a guy with a knife. So uh, very updated, very real training scenarios. And it also shows you how to train underneath the uh, adrenaline dump, which most people never get to. And uh, that itself can cause the, the fight or flight or the freeze uh, syndrome. So I think they have a lot to offer and uh, it's been very to start from. Now, Jason, what do you see as, if, there, if you see any at all, as challenges adopting, adapting a military martial art to the general American public, you know, a Joe Blow civilian versus somebody that's in the armed forces. Are there challenges there? Do things need to be changed, or can they learn the same way? Well, I, I've seen where uh, Krav Maga has already dealt with that, um, and it's become popular today. So uh, a lot of people know what's going on. Uh, the biggest difference, I would say, is that in the civilian sector, you really shouldn't teach any of the quick kill uh, type moves. And you can still teach them very effective self-defense. Like I said, uh, take care of the threat. You know, if it's a chokehold, take care of the chokehold. Once you're able to get the free, uh, free and away to safety, don't stay there and engage with the guy and have an ego fight with him, see who's the best fighter. Uh, so that type of uh, training, I would say, very good for civilian factor. Uh, for the special forces and all those guys, they have to learn a little bit more as far as uh, the quick kill techniques, the World War II type stuff where uh, they may be by themselves, they may be out of ammo, and they may have to rely on actually killing someone with their hands. Now, Jason, one aspect of, of training that is important for me, but it can be kind of polarizing for other instructors, is firearms training. Uh, some martial arts instructors are really big advocates of firearms training for civilians, and others frown upon it. Where do you fall on the the idea of integrating firearms training into martial arts training? I think it's it's very important, very very important. I think everyone should get some basic training on firearms, and then they could have the choice of whether they want to uh, follow that training on their own or with their instructor or whether it's not for them. But uh, I think everyone should be exposed to it. Me personally, it is a part of what I teach, a very big part. Uh, we do a lot of firearms training, stress training, drills, all the time on the firing range. And I think it's something that uh, is needed today, to be honest, with the, uh, the way the world is and uh, violence is ex escalating. And even just being in something like uh, Katrina, uh, where the, the system just breaks down and you have to rely on yourself, uh, knowing how to use firearms would be very useful, very good defensive tactic. Great. And Jason, because, because I'm a little bit more familiar with some of the projects you've been involved with in the past, tell us how you feel about you know, urban and wilderness survival skills being integrated into martial arts training. Do you feel it's necessary? Do you think it has a place in a martial arts school? Or do you think that's something that students should be doing on their own? I personally, uh, and not just from being in the military, but uh, having a family, I always saw that as being uh, something that was missing as a martial artist. I always felt like, hey, we, we need to be like the warrior, the farang or the samurai and those guys who uh, who could go out in the wilderness and survive, basic survival skills. Uh, today, again, I think it's very important with all the different things that happen, the hurricanes and, and the flooding and all these things, 
just to have basic skills and be able to survive um, even for a day or two until you get help or help arrives. Uh, I teach it all the time. I have uh, what I call my special forces martial arts camps. I uh, just did one two months ago in Florida, and all the martial artists loved it. Everyone, karate guys, the kids, everybody learned how to uh, make fire, how to survive, how to make shelter, all kinds of stuff. We had a lot of fun. Now, tell us a little bit more about that camp, because that's a very unique experience. This is something, is this something that you have to be more of an advanced level to be able to participate, or is this something that somebody can walk in off the street and benefit from? Camp was made uh, with the person who has had no training at all. Uh, so we bring them in, and it's it's almost like a movie, uh, kind of like a movie script is what I offer them, which is uh, what people say is unique about my camps. Uh, so we'll bring them in, and as soon as they come in and sign up, uh, we'll have a, our guys come in, and some people get bags put over their head. Everybody gets zip-tied. And the first lesson we learn is how to break out of zip ties or duct tape. And then it kind of goes from there, just like a movie. Uh, your next your next station is going to be how to deal with knives. Your next one's going to be gun threats. Your next one's going to be clubs. Uh, we even drive around in a bus that we rent, and we do uh, public transportation where somebody jumps out out of nowhere, and all of a sudden he's hijacking the bus. So people love it. I think it's needed. I think once you're exposed to it and you have a game plan, you'll do better when it happens for real. Uh, hopefully it doesn't happen, but if it does, you've been there and you have a plan. And it's a very interesting uh, you know, concept for the camp. Uh, there's very few instructors that I know that do anything even remotely similar to that type of training. And I'm, I'm sorry, I, I missed the one that you did in Florida. I saw the Flyers for it and I would have loved to attend it. Jason, you mentioned the, the Farang and the Samurai. And as you know, the, the Raven tribe is, is dedicated to developing the warrior lifestyle. And I'd like to ask you, what element of spirituality or you know, value training is involved with your brand of martial arts? In my martial art, and uh, this is very, very much among the Korean uh, combat arts, uh, they take the four powers – and by that, I mean uh, physical training is one, internal training or key, and they have mental training, which is uh, Shingang, and then they have weapons power, which is uh, your Mugi Hang. And when we get into talking about spiritual, which falls under Neigang, which is uh, internal training, key development, breathing, uh, meditation, you would have your yoga in there and so forth. Uh, that's a very big part of it. It's kind of like you have to have the uh, the yin and the yang, so uh, that would totally imbalance. Um, one thing that I do with Shingon, which has helped me personally get through some uh, very hairy ordeals, is the way the Korean language is set up, it's almost like it's past tense. So whereas we would say, uh, leave me alone or I'm going to beat you up, their response translates as, you have been beaten up. So they're almost living in the future. And just that kind of confidence and thinking in that type of matrix helped me a lot in uh, situations I was in. So even language can help you very much. Um, I'm very much into there's a greater power, whatever you, you call him to be, God or whoever. I think it's important. Uh, I think it helps the warrior deal with the unknown. Now, what about morality, Jason? Because that's something that I feel is is sorely lacking, I think, in a lot of the modern training. A lot of the older generation seems to have been tuned in a lot more to that aspect of training. Just, you know, citizenship at, at the very basic level, just being a good person, you know, having humility and having values. What system of training do you, do, do you have for, for value training in, in your martial art? Because I know that that was a big component of the historical Korean martial arts. Oh, yes. I still follow, and I think a lot of the uh, Taekwondo schools, even though uh, many have become after-school programs, they still preach the, the values, uh, honor your parents, honor your country, and, and so forth. 
uh, I still believe in those rules. Uh, I also believe in, in the nine virtues, you know, being honorable, being trustworthy, uh, helping your friends and family. I think all of that is very important and also makes you a better person and a better martial artist, actually. Uh, not to put the, uh, the MMA guys down, <laughs> because it is a, a fantastic sport at a very high level, um, but they do seem to lack the humility a lot and uh, a lot of the basic values and virtues that uh, traditional martial artists have. And I've actually seen them kind of burn out or get to a high level so quickly uh, that they get hurt and permanent injuries and so forth. So like you, I totally believe you have to have values you have to have honor, and you have to have a, a set of discipline to be a good person morally. Now, Jason, I know you and I were talking offline, and your new website is going to be launching tomorrow. And this is a new step for you with the Nine Dragon system. What What's in store for people? What's coming down the pike as far as your new projects and uh, what you have planned for, for your new system? Yeah, uh, the Nine Dragons Martial Arts dot com that'll be uh, launching tomorrow. It is basically everything I have ever learned through my martial arts training, which right now is about fifty four years, uh, having traveled all over the world, having trained in uh, every martial art I could try out, uh, just to learn the the essence of the arts, the culture, the people. So I wanted to take all that knowledge and training and put it in uh, under one house or one roof and make it available to all people, all martial artists. So Nine Dragons will be a, a basic system that you're used to, just like karate or taekwondo. Um, but then they'll have the other aspects where you can learn about the, uh, the special forces, hapkido, the weaponry, uh, the knife stick, everything you can think of, uh, firearms. I've also thrown in there everything I've learned from the Israelis as far as Krav Maga, Kapat, and actually training with the IDF, uh, things I think will help people, save people's lives, uh, a lot of survival solutions, and uh, just want to put it out there and give back to the community, uh, give back to the martial arts, which I love uh, so much. Well, Jason, before we wrap up, please tell the audience where they can find you on the web they want to reach out to you, maybe look for training if they're in your area, or if they want to come out for one of your specialty camps. Tell us where we can get a hold of you. Okay. Um, the website launches tomorrow. We'll have all my info. It is uh, nine, the number nine, dragonsmartialarts.com. Uh, another website you can go to uh, currently or right now would be Ultimate Krav Maga system.com and that has all my information and that one's uh, up and running right now well great thank you Jason so much for being on and hopefully we can have you on future episodes to talk a little bit more specifically and, and delve into you know detail some of your great martial arts experience and, and uh, you maybe hear about your travels because I definitely would love to pick your brain next time about uh, visiting all these different military units and, and learning what you've learned I look forward to that. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm really honored to be with the Raven Group. I look forward to working with you again. Okay. Thank you, Jason. It's been a pleasure.